So, hi everyone. I'm going to be giving a quick talk on septal hematoma, which is one of the more common ENT emergencies that every ENT SHO should be familiar with how to manage. Uh, this will be part of our A to Z in ENT teaching series. Further talks can be found on either the YouTube channel or on the website a to z in ent.co.uk. This is aimed at the level of a, an ENT SHO or an incoming ENT SHO. Content. So we'll talk about what a septal hematoma is and how it comes about. Some of the nasal anatomy involved with, with this, uh, pathophysiology, etiology and causes, symptoms and signs you should be looking for when assessing a patient with a possible septal hematoma, how to manage one what happens if we don't manage one correctly. So in terms of what it is, so septal hematoma, as the name suggests, is a collection of blood between the overlying mucopericondrium and the underlying septal hematoma, the septal cartilage, beg your pardon. So the septal cartilage gains its blood supply from the overlying mucopericondrium. So if this lining is disrupted and a hematoma or blood gets in the way of in the way um, then the blood supply to the septum is compromised ischemia will shortly follow and then ultimately necrosis of the septal cartilage so it does need to be drained fairly urgently it's important to recognize this because of that risk so a little bit on the anatomy of the septum and of the nose so there's several parts of the septum that you need to be aware of so first of all, the col columella, as shown in the top left and the, and the bottom left picture, this is the most anterior and inferior part of the septum. It's comprising just soft tissue. So you can feel it on your own nose. And then the membranous septum. This is the narrow portion at the lower end of the nasal septum between the cartilaginous septum and the columella. It's freely mobile, as shown in this top, top picture on the left. And then the septum proper. So this is an osteocartilaginous framework. It's covered by the nasal mucous membrane. Then you have the bony parts of the septum. So the vomer and the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid, as demonstrated in the picture on the top left. A Little bit on the blood supply to the nose. So this will have been covered in more detail in our epistaxis talk. You can check that out. Ultimately, the blood supply includes blood supply from both the internal carotid artery and the external carotid artery. You've got Little's area here in the circle, also known as Kessel Bax plexus. This is where all these arteries unite to form the most well supplied area of the nose. And it's the most common part of the septum for epistaxis, for an anterior epistaxis. Uh, so the anterior and posterior ethmoid arteries are branches of the ophthalmic artery, which is a branch of the internal carotid. Um, the sphenopalatine artery is a branch of the maxillary artery of the external carotid. Important to be aware of the sphenopalatine artery as an SPA ligation is a fairly common emergency procedure performed in ENT for epistaxis that isn't effectively being managed with just nasal packing. They need to tie off that artery. The septal branch of the greater palatine artery also comes up to supply Little's area, as well as the septal branch of the labial artery down here in the bottom right. The labial, labial artery is the branch of the facial artery. So in terms of the pathophysiology of a septal hematoma, so most frequently occurs some trauma to the nasal septum damaging the underlying submucosal blood vessels, leading to hematoma formation between the septum and the overlying mucopericondrium. This is all assuming that the mucosa remains intact, hence allowing the hematoma to form underneath the mucosa. If the mucosa was breached, then the blood would leak out and you, you would just have an epistaxis at this point. If high forces are involved, you can get fractures of the septal cartilage, which then leads to blood leaking across the contralateral side, causing a bilateral hematoma. The bilateral hematoma is actually more common than a unilateral hematoma, 
because trauma is the main mechanism. Uh, however, a unilateral hematoma can still occur, so um, also look out for this. And as mentioned previously, that elevation of the overlying perichondrium from the cartilage compromises the blood supply to the cartilage, resulting in ischemia and necrosis. If the septal hematoma is unilateral, it may not cause necrosis due to contralateral blood supply. So it's a little bit less worrying than a, than a bilateral septal hematoma. However, it still needs to be drained urgently because leaving it can result in permanent, permanent thickening and fibrosis of the septum if it's not drained, which can lead to uh, other issues, nasal blockage further down the line. In terms of the etiology, so as previously mentioned, nasal trauma is by far the most common cause and it should always be uh, assessed in the history. Uh, they may well have a nasal fracture. So look out for this, look for external swelling and bruising of the nose, any nasal deformity. Can also get it just from picking the nose, which is a form of nasal trauma, foreign bodies to the nose obviously depending on the foreign body, less common, uh, harsh nose blowing too. It is possible to get a septal hematoma without a history of trauma, but much rarer. So at this point, you're looking into collagen and vascular disorders. And, um, whether the patient's on anticoagulants, which obviously would make the bleed worse, and uh, tumours too, so a, a tumour within the septal cartilage can bleed and lead to a septal hematoma. In terms of the history, so um, with trauma being the main part of the history, it's important to ask about any events preceding the present, this patient presenting, um, and also ask about whether there's any symptoms or signs elsewhere in the body, they may well have sustained other injuries to the head and neck. So uh, it's important to, to look into this too. Um, immediately, the patient may be presenting with nasal blockage or pain, may have had an episode of epistaxis following the traumatic episode. You may need to deal with this depending on how heavy the bleed is, but often it's self-resolving and may well have stopped by the time you see the patient. And uh, important to ask about other medical conditions and medications that can exacerbate the, the bleeding or may have contributed to it. So when examining the patient, first of all, look for any signs of other head trauma. So manage as per your ATLS principles. Are there any signs of a basal skull fracture or injuries elsewhere? So then have a look at the nose. Is there any external swelling, soft tissue swelling, deformity or bruising? And then, and then get your nasal thudicum out and have a closer look in the nose. I don't have a picture of a nasal thudicum here, but uh, you should familiarise yourself with what one looks like and how to use one. So in terms of management, so requires urgent referral to the ENT team because it requires prompt drainage to avoid that risk of necrosis. So ultimately it needs to be incised and drained. This can be done either with a scalpel or you can aspirate. However, needle aspiration so with a needle on the end of a syringe um, does run the risk of an increased risk of reaccumulation. So it's less ideal. However, if you're DSHO on overnight, and registrars at home, it can, it can buy you time until the morning. If you have drained the hematoma and it may well come back, but um, it could be have a more formal drainage in the daytime if you're not comfortable using a scalpel. Also, if you're not completely sure that it is a septal hematoma, and obviously it's out of hours, it's not so easy to ask someone, you could you can pop a needle with a syringe in, try and aspirate some blood out, and it ultimately that's going to give you the answer. The worst that you can cause here is a, a bit of epistaxis, but that can also be dealt with. Uh, but formal drainage with a scalpel and to suction the blood coming out as well, this is, the, this is more ideal. Obviously, you've applied your local anaesthetic with a spray first, so a lidocaine and preferably a vasoconstriction. Uh, it's important to 
pack the nasal cavity after draining, otherwise it's likely to just reaccumulate. Depending on whether the septal hematoma was unilateral or bilateral, but um, that would determine whether you put the pack in both nostrils or just one. Um, this is a picture of a Merosel pack, which is particularly useful because it's a bit less traumatic than, say, a rapid rhino. <laughs> Picture on the right it almost looks like a tampon inserted into the nose, absorbs the blood and soft and, um, and fluid to then swell up and mold itself to the nasal cavity. Uh, important to give prophylactic antibiotics since you're putting a foreign body into the nasal cavity, runs a risk of being infected. So you can either admit the patient overnight uh, and then review in the morning on the ward round with your registrar or they can be books to review within, within several days in a treatment room clinic, just to check for any, any reaccumulation. So here's some pictures of what septal hematoma might look like. That's soft fluctuant swelling, more, more usually bilateral, shown in the first three pictures. However, you also can see a unilateral one as well. And uh, you'll want to use either a, a Jobson horn or, say, a swab or any blunt instrument that can allow you to assess whether the hematoma is, is soft or fluctuant. You can also just use your little finger with a glove on too. And then the bottom right picture depicts an incision and drainage of it and then packing the nose. So complications, so if not urgently drained, can lead to ischemia and necrosis of septal cartilage. And then this can result in what we call a saddle nose deformity, as shown in the picture here. And if you, if you Google that, you'll see many other examples of what this looks like. If not drained quickly enough, it can also develop into a septal abscess too. So it's important to recognise anyone presenting with a possible septal hematoma and um, manage appropriately. Thank you very much. I will attach a survey monkey below. Be uh, grateful for any feedback, please.